The Unshackled Waves, episode 177. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. The social media deplatforming of those on the right has continued this week. Last week it was Alex Jones and Infowars. They were kicked off Facebook, YouTube, Spotify and iTunes and their app was uh, shadow banned on the App Store. On the weekend, Gavin McGuinness and the Proud Boys were suspended from Twitter for violating their policies prohibiting violent extremist groups. Fraser Anning gave a triggering maiden speech to the Senate on Tuesday evening where he lamented the demise of the white Australia policy and traditional Australia and expressed his support for a ban on Muslim immigration and called for a plebiscite as a final solution to the immigration issues in Australia. There was a riot in Melbourne last Wednesday night by a gang of Sudanese youths, yet a group of Melbourne mayors emerged to tell us that reporting on this was racist. And Malcolm Turnbull, with Parliament back this week, got the victory he was after in the Coalition Party Room with his signature energy policy, the National Energy Guarantee, being approved. However, he still needs to get all the states to agree, and he will need Labor support given that the eight coalition backbenchers have reserved the right to cross the floor, including Tony Abbott. It's another bumper show today with different guests. First, I'll be speaking with US-based proud boy Jason Van Dyke. He was recently featured on Australian television on SBS Dateline's episode on the Proud Boys as part of their Defending Gender series. Jason, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thank you. Now, uh, Gavin McGuinness and the, the Proud Boys were the, the next victims of this apparent uh, coordinated social media uh, deplatforming. Now, it happened uh, as it happened with Infowars uh, all of a, a sudden. Do you have, can you give us the inside word on how, how this unfolded? Well, I know that uh, here in the United States, it really started with Alex Jones uh, in the earlier part of uh, next week. It was really kind of surreal. I don't think myself or anyone else has really ever seen a mass deplatforming of a conservative like that. Uh, I'm not, I don't watch a lot of Alex Jones. I, I watch him sometimes. There is some stuff that he says that I enjoy. But it was like one day he's there, he's really easy to get. The next day, every single social media platform had essentially kicked him off, except for Twitter. And now I'm hearing that uh, today he's been removed from Twitter as well. And uh, people knew this was bad when it happened. Uh, the short-term effect is that it shot his app to uh, first to number four. And now I think it might be at number one on the uh, app store for Apple and some of these uh, phone makers. But then on Friday, they suspended Gavin McInnes and every account associated with the Proud Boys from Twitter and that's what uh, got me involved in this entire process. Again, love Alex Jones, love what he does. Don't watch him a whole lot, but I'm part of the Proud Boys. I subscribe to CRTV. I never really used Twitter, but uh, this is uh, very disturbing. It sets a very bad precedent, I think, and it's something that is going to need to be addressed in one way or another. Now, what people have uh, found out, uh, obviously, all Gavin's tweets have now disappeared, but it appeared the, the last tweet that he sent out before his account was uh, suspended was him and, uh, on behalf of the Proud Boys, uh, disavowing the, the second uh, Unite the Right rally, which uh, happened uh, on Sunday in uh, Washington, uh, D.C., which was, it, it was an interesting last, last tweet that that was the, the last one before they, they pulled it. I, I think it was quite ironic, too. I, I, this is the second interview I've done today. Earlier today, I talked to a reporter uh, with a newspaper out in Oakland, San Francisco area called the Bay Area Reporter. It's a uh, newspaper that covers uh, LGBTQ plus affairs. And they had written a nasty story about the Proud Boys. And I said, no, the reason I think this has happened to the Proud Boys, and I believe Gavin has touched on this, is because the Proud Boys are mainstream. 
they are they reflect what a lot of conservatives are these days. No one cares what Jason Kessler has to say anymore. I don't think a lot of people ever really did. Richard Spencer never really had a real audience. His base is about 30 people. It's a statistically insignificant number. Uh, not many people listen to him. Where the Proud Boys, we've got membership probably around 5,000. I mean, there's fewer in the Facebook groups, but there's a lot of them that don't use Facebook. I, I would guesstimate the Proud Boys membership at around 5,000. We appeal to more people because, because we are not like Richard Spencer and Jason Kessler. We allow uh, gay men in our fraternity. Uh, we are a multiracial fraternity. We condemn white nationalism on the strongest possible terms. Uh, we want there to be free speech. We're about maximum freedom. And because of the broader appeal of the Proud Boys, my opinion is that Twitter and these social media platforms uh, with the midterm elections here in the United States uh, only a couple months away, they feel threatened by it. The Proud Boys accounts were suspended, uh, Twitter said, because uh, it violated their rules on uh, extremist uh, groups. Uh, now, as you just mentioned there, the, the Proud Boys manifesto, it's broadly libertarian and non-racist, but probably uh, what uh, makes the, the, the Proud Boys, why people classified in that extreme category is because they do to a degree promote uh, physical confrontations because there's the different degrees in the Proud Boys. The, the second degree is getting the, the crap beaten out of you until you can name five breakfast cereals and then the the fourth degree is putting your body on the line uh, for the for the cause, which uh, normally involves getting into uh, a scuffle with the the local Antifa uh, at a rally. So uh, that probably or oh, gave Twitter an excuse to say these these people are a violent uh, extreme group. You know what? The, the second degree of initiation. It's kind of funny. First of all, uh, Gavin's been very clear. This started with a fart joke. <laughs> It's how the second degree really started, something uh, from his childhood. You know, I was in a fraternity in college, uh, and the initiations, the kind of stuff that happened behind closed doors that I can't talk about, um, not necessarily during formal initiations, but as part of the pledgeship process, far worse than anything we ever do to people in the second degree of initiation. I mean, I've gone through it again. Uh, I, I've done it more than once uh, because, you know, it's fun. It builds uh, camaraderie. They're our friends. They very well might get hurt, and we let them know that, but I've never seen it really happen to, to an extent where anyone suffered severe injuries during an initiation or had to go to the hospital or anything like that. As far as the fourth degree that goes, there have been instances where people have gotten a fourth degree with nonviolence. Uh, you might be familiar with the Halifax Five. Those were f uh, five service members in Canada who are fourth degrees, and they didn't get into a violent physical confrontation at all. They were uh, they faced the loss of their jobs in the military based on a very peaceful yet firm confrontation with uh, people who were protesting Canada Day, and they're considered fourth degrees. So what what constitutes a fourth degree is really kind of left to the discretion of the local chapters. That's kind of a guideline. And one thing that is not mentioned are it's against our rules uh, to go out looking for trouble. We don't go out looking for people to beat up. What happens are these anti-fascist protesters come to these events with the intention of starting violence. And like what we saw with the Rufio Panman video that went viral, we defend ourselves. Everyone says, oh, well, the Proud Boys knocked out an anti-fascist protester. Well, they don't talk about it the first couple seconds of that video clip where you can very clearly see Rufio getting hit with an ass baton. It's a steel baton like what police carry. He's getting hit with a metal baton and he knocks the guy out. That's probably why he wasn't charged. It's self-defense. Now, uh, unlike uh, Alex Jones, who was suspended from four, or uh, now it's five social media platforms, the, the Proud Boys uh, are only suspended for, uh, from Twitter. Uh, so you still have the, 
the rest of social media and Proud Boys groups are particularly active on on Facebook. But who knows uh, where, whether Facebook will, will pull the pin. The, the, the Proud Boys, they do have uh, several uh, websites. Is there a strategy in place that if uh, Facebook or, or any other major uh, social media tech company does pull the pin at any moment, there's a way for uh, you guys to communicate and, and still uh, maintain your uh, activism and activity? Well, uh, yes. And one of the things I've suggested is we create our own platforms. We own our own servers. We make, I mean, this is, it's, it can be a costly thing to do, but we've got a, a good membership base. We've got a charitable membership base. It wouldn't be a particularly difficult thing for us to do. I can tell you that uh, that's definitely a conversation that people are having right now in the face of this, because there is the concern about not being able to communicate. But, you know, people communicated and organized without social media for years. I didn't have social media in college. I was in college between, well, if you include law school, I was in college between 1998 and 2006. Social media was just getting started during those years, and we still had ways to organize and communicate. Um, I was part of a lot of conservative groups and involved in the conservative activism during those years of my life. I don't think they can stop us from organizing. And uh, obviously the, the Proud Boys are the, the second major uh, victim, and of course they're always conservatives of this uh, uh, deplatforming. Where, where do you see this going because last week when it happened to Alex Jones and Nifa was was like whoa if they can take down him they can pretty much take down anybody and then this happens on the weekend uh, where do you predict this will go I think what we're going to start seeing is we're going to start seeing a lot more mainstream conservative voices deplatformed I would not be at all surprised if President Trump the Trump campaign uh Things like that get deplatformed going into the uh, 2020 election because the perception among a lot of people is that social media helped get President Trump elected, and they don't want to see that happen again. And if that starts to happen, I think there needs to be some congressional investigations of whether this is legal, whether this amounts to a essentially a donation in kind to the Democratic Party. But I think what we're seeing now is only the beginning. And where do you come down on, because there's a, a debate uh, amongst, or especially amongst libertarians, about whether these private companies, uh, are they allowed to refuse service to anyone they want, or is there some obligation as social media companies to allow all views? That's a very difficult uh, question. Um, my, I don't speak for all the Proud Boys on this. There is a great deal of disagreement in the group, and that's kind of what's wonderful. We respect each other's views in this organization. My personal view is that a judge in a case where President Trump blocked some people on Twitter and a judge came down against that, holding that Twitter has become a public forum, I think uh, it, that that can be applicable to this is such type of situation as well. These social media companies have become such an integral part of the political landscape that's become a means through which to communicate. Certainly, it would not be permissible for a cell phone company to cut off cell phone access or to an individual for because of their views. And I think we could be headed the same direction on these social media companies. I would prefer that not be the solution. What I would prefer to see is a billionaire, a billionaire or a group of billionaires like the Koch brothers or something like that, develop a platform that is dedicated to free speech. Uh, we see that a little bit with Gab. But, you know, the same week, we saw Microsoft threatening to take down the hosting services for Gab if they didn't start censoring some speech. Now, that speech was anti-Semitic speech. I certainly don't condone that speech, but I, I do think it indicates the direction things are headed, and I think it's scary, and I think something needs to be done about it. Yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens next or, or where, where this goes. But uh, whatever happens, the, the, the Proud Boys there, as the expression goes, too, too big to fail now. You're, uh, you're in 
all Western countries now, you're, you're starting to grow right here uh, in Australia. And uh, unlike a lot of groups on the internet, you meet uh, face to face, so you've got that ad advantage. So appreciate you, uh, Jason, uh, coming on the show today. I know it's late in the uh, United States, but thanks for giving us uh, the first-hand perspective. Anytime. Thank you for having me, Tim. Now on with the rest of the week in Australian politics, including the return of federal parliament after the winter break, we welcome back to the show the Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. It's good to be back, Tim. Uh, and we've actually delayed this recording by probably about an hour because the, the story we're going to discuss first has kept uh, developing, and that is Fraser Anning's very uh, triggering uh, maiden speech he gave in the Senate uh, last night. Now, even though he's been in the Senate since November 2017, when he replaced uh, One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts, who was knocked out because of dual citizenship, it's, it's only happened now. Now, the speech went for 37 minutes. I've watched it in full. He spoke about rural issues, belief in traditional values, uh, small government and personal responsibility. He attacked uh, degeneracy and cultural Marxism. But what was uh, no most noteworthy about his speech was uh, lamenting the white Australia policy, uh, talked about uh, migrants needing to assimilate and his opposition to multiculturalism. Uh, he also talked about uh, he wanted a ban on Muslim immigration, which, as polls have shown, has uh, wide support in the community, he wants foreign worker and family reunion rules tightened. But probably what set everyone off was that he used the term final solution when calling for a plebiscite on uh, immigration. Ooh. <laughs> Out of context, it sounds really bad because, as those of us who are historically literate are aware, the phrase final solution was the phrase coined for the purpose of talking about Adolf Hitler's extermination of the Jews, gypsies, and everyone else who was killed during um, in prison camps during World War II by the, um, the Nazi regime. But, you know, I like Fraser. He's, he's, he's actually a very charming down-to-earth guy um however i don't think he realized what people would infer from his statement about presenting a final solution on immigration on the immigration question because and in fact Catter said it himself when we were watching before he went white as a sheet when people started accusing him of being a nazi because he used that phrasing and he thought to him, he must have thought to himself, oh my God, did I say that? Oh my God, they think I'm a Nazi now. When he's not a Nazi, he's just, he's just a typical, he's just a typical conservative nationalist. That's what Anning is. And, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to rip on him for bad phrasing, bad choice of words, because, you know, David Lanhelm has had a bad choice of words lately. Sarah Hansen Young always has a bad choice of words. Um, any politician has always had a bad has a bad choice of words at one point or another. The only thing, because I read through the speech briefly before coming on, because you know, as you know, I couldn't do our podcast last night. My phone had died, and I turned my phone back on this morning, and I find, oh my god, what the hell just happened? <laughs> And I find out that Anning gave his maiden speech. Now, as a slight divergence, the maiden speech under the rules of the Westminster Convention, the maiden speech cannot be interrupted by anyone on the floor of the parliament. So he had as long as he took, which was 35 to 37 minutes, I think you said 37 minutes, yeah. to do his speech. And as a result, no one could interrupt him at that time. Can you imagine all the outrage building, all the confected outrage building from um, from all the the lefties, the righties, and anyone in between who decided, oh, he said a horrible thing. Oh, he, he said that immigration should be dealt with in a final solution. Oh, you know, people taking these words out of context. But the only thing that I could really point out here that I would have a concern about and it's a rather minor concern all things considered Tim 
his statement um, in the second half of his speech saying, while all Muslims are not terrorists, certainly all terrorists these days are Muslims. That's probably the only thing I could pick. Everything else he said, I think a lot of people agree with. Whether they, whether they say it out loud or not, I think a lot of people actually agree with it or at least sympathize to some level with what Fraser, was, sorry, Senator Anning was saying. Apart from the technically incorrect statement he made about all terrorists being Muslim, apart from that, there's nothing I could find objectionable about. It's nothing that most people find objectionable. Uh, you look at some of the pages this morning and you see that a lot of people are actually saying, you know what, he's got a point. And this is one thing I have to add. Sorry, before we continue, one thing I have to add. Pauline Hanson doing her little spurg out session saying, oh, it's right out of Goebbels' handbook. Hello, Pot, this is the kettle speaking. Do you not remember 1996, your maiden speech in 1996, and now you have the height to call him a Nazi? Hey, and Bitch, let... please. Let's, uh, let's not forget how he, how he got there. He was third on the, the One Nation ticket at the last election. He's actually well, been in the party for uh, 20 years. He, he, he's been uh, with Pauline Hanson well, since Mark won. So certainly it's, <laughs> it's a bit rich and definitely cowardly of, of her now to uh, disavow him. And she, she also said that One Nation was uh, diverse. And oh, f uh, Pauline Hanson's response while, uh, to his speech, while it was uh, pretty uh, appalling in itself, uh, the, the political class, they've been uh, f trying to reaffirm Australia's uh, non-discriminatory immigration policy today. Everyone from both sides of politics has been outraged by it. There was a handshake in Parliament between Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten. There was a hug uh, between uh, Josh Frydenberg, uh, who's Jewish, and Ed Husick, who's uh, Muslim. There was uh, Anne Ali breaking down into uh, to tears. I saw it there, uh, on the, the news the Laura Jay's uh, getting uh, triggered again. Uh, we're, we're with her uh, monologue at the, at the beginning of the show. But if you have a look at the comments on all of the, the social media stories condemning Fraser Anning, all the, like they, they don't care about the, the, the final solution phrase, which, which did go, I, I think, too, uh, too far, but everyone just seems to have sort of let it slide. I, I, I wonder whether, because everyone's saying that he must have chosen it deliberately, uh, whether he might have been trying to sort of dog whistle to Australia's alt-right to sort of say, I'm one of you, I'm the, I'm the most hardcore. But yeah, today, everyone's, everyone's saying, even, even though there were flaws in his speech, they're saying, on the whole, that it was refreshing. Exactly. And, and here's another thing, Tim. If he were trying to dog whistle to the alt-right, he did a pretty shitty job at it. Sorry, pardon my language. He did a pretty poor job at it because... He's, you know, he's been pro-Israel. He actually voted to move the Australian embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem to echo what Trump did earlier in the year. And, you know, the old right who do have a tendency to be infiltrated by na people that the mainstream will call Nazis would look at that and think he's still, well, several words I won't repeat publicly for, you know, obvious reasons because the child watcher says this already been exposed to a couple of crude words too many but you get the idea we're both smart men we both know how it goes it's it's not an effective dog whistle and it wasn't a dog whistle thing at all that i don't believe at least i don't believe he was trying to dog whistle he is simply pointing out what most people of his generation believed at the time and it wasn't a racist thing it wasn't a racial thing it was Look, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. When in Australia, do as the Australians do. Integrate, learn our laws, cherish our values, edify our country. It's that simple. You know, no no one in Parliament, certainly not Fraser and certainly not Bob Catter, who's backed him, would disagree with that. The difference seems to be a matter of interpretation of what is considered edification, what is not considered edification. That's probably the closest you can actually get to um, a divergence of opinion in regards to 
a sort of more robust civic nationalism, really. And when you think about it, it's nothing objectionable. I mean, all the, as you pointed out, as we both pointed out already, all the comments that have been made just about actually say, you know what, he's got a point, and he does have a point. Now, everyone was awaiting, uh, because uh, Fraser Anning, he's joined uh, Bob Catter's Australian party now. Everyone was awaiting how uh, Bob Catter would uh, respond uh, today. And he gave one of his classic uh, fiery press conferences in, in Cairns, where he said it was a, a magnificent uh, speech. He, he, ta he talked about the that Fraser was right about the, the problems that uh, Muslim uh, immigration uh, has brought. And he, he also addressed the, the controversy around the, the, the final solution saying, oh, I'm sure Fraser didn't mean it uh, uh, that way and talked about how by stopping like Muslim immigration, it actually helps protect Jewish people here in Australia, since their schools have now got to be uh, f uh, have uh, armed patrols there. Uh, so, but he, uh, as uh, to, to use the phrase, Kata, uh, uh, he didn't cuck out. I mean, he he defended his his new uh, senator. He he set the benchmark that well, because Pauline Hanson, she uh, as we just mentioned, she disavowed him, and so Kata. Uh, probably wisely has seen the the opportunity to sort of pounce on on this backing down from Hanson and say, hey, if you want a uh, party which is going to seriously tackle this uh, problem of uh, immigration and multiculturalism, then then vote for us. The thing you have to remember about Catter, not, not a lot of people know this, is that Catter actually came from a time where uh, the Democratic Labor Party the DLP, as they're called, uh, were a force in Australian politics. They were economic nationalists. They were anti-communist. They were very strong conservatively, but also believed in the workers' rights. Um, Kata, his own family, were DLP before the DLP started to die painfully and he became a member of the National Party. Uh, the Nationals actually had a lot in common with DLP, with the DLP in terms of their attitudes. Um, you know, they believed in strong social conservative values. The areas of divergence between the nationals of old and the DLP of old were more based on location rather than actual policy, because they still cared about workers' rights, just not in the same, um, in the same context. Uh, Caddo used to be the mines minister under Joe, and this is something that a lot of people will know. He used to be the mines minister. Then he remained in the National Party, became the member for Kennedy, and eventually got the got fed up with what he deemed to be the selling out of National Party values by, um, perhaps unfairly, by Tim Fisher and John Anderson and Warren Truss. So he ended up splitting away and started his own party. Uh, that party is, the party is very much economically nationalist because that's the kind of mold he has. It's the kind of vision he has to have a strong socially conservative Australia with respect for the workers' rights and respect for the rights of private property simultaneously. A lot of parties don't have that. They either tilt in favour of one side or the other. So you have the Liberals tilt in favour in favour of neoliberalism and the Labour Party in favour of social democracy, as it might be called. So, yeah, so there's no balance. Kata, for all of his faults, has an ideology that, well, it's not really an ideology, it's more of an attitude, really, uh, that believes in the old Australia the way Australia was when it was Australia was in its golden age under Menzies, so to speak, before neoliberalism took over and created a massive disparity between the haves and the have-nots. Back when the forgotten people were not forgotten, back when the forgotten people were remembered by Menzies and his government and the DLP in fact shaped some legislation to ensure the welfare of the workers was, you know, guaranteed that's the generation i mean I, some people might say oh he's a boomer conservative well no because 
60s Australia was 50s and 60s Australia was the golden age. It was only after that that it was the beginning of the end, after Menzies left. But I'm digressing here. The opinions that he has have been ingrained in us um, unconsciously for a long time. And it's not about race. It's not about spite. It's not about identity. It's not about who is different from us and should we reject people who are different from us. It is about... It is about making our country strong, keeping our country great. That's what Catter's mentality is. And Anning, uh, Senator Fraser Anning, sees the decline of Australia for a multitude of reasons, only some of which I've touched on here just now, and says that, you know, we need to look at going back to this. Things were better then. Why don't we try this? And then everyone jumps up and down on him thinking he's a racist, he's a Nazi, he's this, that, or anything else unpleasant just because he loves his country. You know, I'm, I'm, I quite like him personally. As I said before, I quite like him personally. So I'm not going to condemn him for loving his country like we do. You and I, Tim, we love our country. I think everyone, I think even the people who disagree with us probably love our country. They just under, don't understand why other people who love our country don't agree with their opinions on it and their methods on how to fix it. Well, I hope that they love their country, but you never know these days. But it's interesting, while our politicians today were saying multiculturalism is great, our current uh, immigration policy is great, it was just uh, last week that uh, 50 uh, Sudanese youths were rioting in the western Melbourne suburb of uh, Taylor's Hill, and uh, this was over a dispute over a, a teenage girl. Uh, now, specialist police units were uh, deployed, uh, however, no arrests were made on the night. Uh, Daniel Andrews he, uh, and his ministers have uh, consistently and the senior leadership of the Victorian police have said there's no African crime problem and it seemed to be the next day Transport Minister uh, Jacinta Allen, she tried to distract the media by banning Sky News from Metro train platforms because it was a spreader of uh, racism and hatred. There was quite a uh, spot-on cartoon by Mark Knight uh, in the Herald Sun the next day where uh, Jacinta Allen, she's making the train station safe by switching over the channel. Meanwhile, there's all these African news uh, writing behind her. Oh, yes. It's very convenient, isn't it? I mean... The thing is, Sky News already did their self-flagellations and their confected mayor culpas. Although, if you listen to Laura Jays, it seems that it's not so much a confected as a deliberately affected mayor culpa. Taking Sky News off the stations was just a petty piece of virtue signalling that also happened to be very convenient. Very convenient. And this is something, I, I got it from, uh, I downloaded it from to my phone actually. It was from the Australian, uh, I think it was last week. They were talking about who was committing the most violent crimes, uh, the percentage of Victorian offenders by place of birth. Now, there is context here that it must be understood. Greater than one equals number of times overrepresented. Less than one equals underrepresented. Now, these are sources sourced from the Victorian Crime Statistics Agency and the Census. So, bear this in mind. This isn't just some right-wing scaremongering, Tim. This is figures, the Victorian government's own figures saying this. Aggravated burglary. Uh, uh, remember, this is by both place. Um, over or under representation crime statistics. People born in Australia. 1.2 people born in Australia who are Australians. 1.2 percent. 1.2 percent. Sudan and South Sudan, 25.3. 25.3. That is almost 25 times. This is almost 24, 25 times the regular figure of that of Australians. Uh, New Zealand is 2.4, so double the Australian figure. That's pretty staggering to be fair, but still not as bad as Sudan and South Sudan. 
Vietnam, 0.8%. So they're cool. They're fine. Um, Iraq, 2.3%. So even if you add the overrepresentations and the underrepresentation of Vietnam in those figures together, they are still less than a quarter of the overrepresentation of the Sudanese and South Sudanese. And that's just for aggravated burglary alone, by the way. That's not for um, crime in general. Well, it's uh, for the Sudanese. It's uh, six uh, six times they're they're overrepresented, and, uh, and Somalia, another African nation, that's they're three times over uh, re represented. And yeah, it's. Uh, Contrary to what Tim Supomasani says, it's it's not uh, uh, the African crime wave in uh, Melbourne. It's not an inv an invention by dog whistling politician or race baiting uh, media outlets. It's there in the facts that you've just cited there, and they, even the the ABC they uh, did this analysis on the weekend, and all they could come up with to sort of balance the piece was uh, interviewing a few. Uh, Sudanese people saying that, oh, we believe that when people see us in the streets, they're thinking bad things. Like they're not, they're not actually doing anything to like when they see these Sudanese people, they just might be thinking bad thoughts. Well, there are two things I could say to this. One, if you're worried about what people think, clean up your image. And to the parents who think, oh. They're going to think the other people are going to think badly. It was raise your children better. It's so hard. Raise your freaking children better. And I say this to anyone. I don't care what your color is. You don't raise your children well, they're going to end up in trouble. They're going to end up committing crime. So raise your children better. It is that simple. And despite um, uh, Daniel Andrews and his uh, senior police clearly unable to uh, cope with this uh, African crime wave uh, i mean all all, all they've ever uh, done is try to like play it down they haven't really proposed any serious law and order solutions i mean there's only so much that the federal of course government not, can do they would rather charge axiomatic sixty eight thousand dollars to do what they're supposed to do which is protect the safety of the public sixty eight thousand dollars it was going to be one hundred fifty thousand at one point Matthew I actually actually say this now. I couldn't say it before, but I can actually like, say it now. It's then they it's like sixty eight thousand dollars. Like, come on. Victorian police has become a freaking joke. Makes the police of Joe's Moonlight State look like freaking amateurs by comparison. The protection done by Terry Lewis and his corrupt cops makes it, it is nothing even close to the sheer cravenness of Vic Pol. And I, I will publicly say Vic Pol needs a good ass kicking. Their and friggin' upper officers need a good ass kicking and, or, and, to, and a reminder to do their job. And they don't provide any solutions. And they, don't have the, they either don't have the will to or they don't have the resources to. I'm thinking it's the will that, that they lack. I mean, crimes are happening every day. You've got Arby Yemeni pointing out the the sheer predations of the um, the apex gangs, but no one listens. To, but no one's really listening to them, at least on the halls of power. And as a result, more and more people from Melbourne are deciding, well, bugger this, we're out. We're going to move elsewhere. And then there was uh, eight and, you know, Melbourne that's... suburban mayors who came out earlier this week with a, a leader of the the African Australian community calling on the the media to stop the uh racist uh, reporting i mean a, a riot involving 50 like sudanese youth how else are you meant to report that these incidents keep occurring there was a and how is it even racist you know it's reporting on a thing that and on an event that happened and for an, and for another thing you know i haven't even gone to the stats on aggravated robbery serious assault and riot and affray yet i'll send them to you later so you know we don't have to um flog the same dead horse but you know you've got to report on news it's what the media is supposed to do if something happens you report on it you don't just say oh we can't we can't report on this because we don't want to offend the ethnics we don't want to offend certain groups pish posh the fourth estate exists purely for the purpose of being a pain in the ass to the establishment 
we need we and i'm saying we including us in the media as well we need to call it as it is we need to report on it we can't just be saying oh no, nothing really happened oh there's an altercation involving you know two or three school youths over a girl you know, I mean, you know, you could have glossed over it like that, I suppose. And of course, the other Congrats. contentious uh, policy issue at the moment, apart from uh, immigration, is energy policy and Malcolm Turnbull's signature energy policy, which he believes is the, the middle ground between uh, huge, uh, large scale rollout of renewable energy and uh, reliable baseload power is the National Energy Guarantee. And it passed a significant internal hurdle in the, the coalition party room where it was approved. Uh, Tony Abbott and seven other uh, coalition backbenchers reserved the right to cross the floor uh, if, if it didn't uh, satisfy uh, their, uh, their concerns. It still needs the support of the states and labor to pass. So there's still a lot that needs to go right for, for Malcolm Turnbull. And let's remember, he only has a one seat majority. So potentially it could be Tony Abbott alone that could stop this policy being implemented. The labor opposition in Canberra will vote against it just out of sheer spite, even though to the credit of the nationals, they have been trying desperately I might add, to enhance the viability and the workability of the NEG. It's still a it's still a negative energy gimmick. I will still call it a negative negative energy gimmick. Just because and I think it was you actually said if I hear the phrase energy mix one more time, I'm gonna flip. I think that was you. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> you know, the energy mix, I'm sorry, Tim, is not adequate. I mean, how much money are they gonna pour into the infrastructure? to make it able to handle both baseload and renewable. Let's say renewable energy actually does what it's supposed to do, actually lasts carbon emissions going into the production of renewable energy generators notwithstanding. How long is the infrastructure going to last? It's not. None of our infrastructures are viable at the moment. They're crumbling, they're sclerotic, they're decaying. This negative energy gimmick is still not going to achieve anything, regardless of whether Labor votes for it in the House of Representatives or not. The only way that it could pass is if the states and the territories that are run by the Labor Party all say, look, Bill, I know this isn't what we want, but we've got no choice. We've got to put this through, otherwise we're never going to get anywhere. We can't just be sitting on our hands and refusing to play ball here. Otherwise, we'll be seen as obstructionists. That's pro probably the only chance that um, Turnbull really has Yeah, and to get the, um, the NEG through. And, and the fact that uh, most of the, the coalition party room don't like Tony Abbott anymore, that it's a lot of those who do have concerns about the, the neg would probably vote for it just to not be, uh, appear to not be seen associated with Tony Abbott and probably just to uh, spite him. Now, uh, this is supposed to help us meet our Paris Climate Accord targets uh, of 26% reduction uh, in emissions. Uh, Tony Abbott, even though the process to sign up to Paris was started by him has said we should withdraw from it given that the, the United States has and we should build a new uh, coal-fired power stations and then uh, to sort of uh, ma make a sort of uh, snipe at Malcolm Turnbull called the neg uh, mentioned banker gobbledygook. Sorry, what was the last thing? Called uh, what, sorry? To, uh, 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 merchant banker gobbledygook. <laughs> well, he's not wrong. <sighs> you know, we, we, we've, we've discussed the energy several times on the show, and every time I have pointed out my concerns with the inadequacies of the NEG and the platform, I keep coming back to the same thing. Two things, actually. Uh, they say, 
one, it's going to bring down power bills. That's crap. It's not going to bring down power bills. They're going to spend a lot of money upgrading the infrastructure. And who's going to pay for it? The retailer is going to pass the costs on to us. So we're still going to end up paying more. Even if the NEG were to work as at its best case scenario, we're still going to end up paying more. So it's not a national energy guarantee it's a national energy gimmick uh, the, the argument the for is, yeah the argument always for it sorry. is that uh labor they they'd want a higher uh renewable energy target uh climate policy of 45 or their, their policy is a 50 percent uh renewable uh, energy target so, so it's basically saying well we have to come up with a less terrible policy so basically you're you're choosing strict what's the you're basically choosing your poison you're choosing you know the liberal party should know better by now you don't try and stop bad policy by preempting a slightly less policy you don't preempt a bad policy with a slightly less bad policy it doesn't work that way how, how could they how they've forgotten this is beyond me you have to look at the real of energy consumption and the energy infrastructure. The infrastructure has been neglected for so long. The states aren't going to upgrade their infrastructures because they're going to be afraid of passing on the cost to the consumers. But they're going to have to come to a stage where they could realize that they're going to have to. And then the prices are going to be passed on to the consumers even more so than they would have been if they'd done their job in the first place. It's just, I'm sorry, Tim. It's just frustrating. It's just frustrating, you know. Queensland used to have the cheapest electricity in the country, and now our electricity, it's still relatively cheap compared to, say, Victoria, but, hell, that's not hard. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's amazing yeah, how it's we've shot hard. out. It's like saying Drover's Dog could have won the, um, won the 2013 election if uh, Drover's Dog were leader of the Liberal Party. Yeah. It's, it's amazing hard. how we've shot ourselves in the in the foot so much when it comes to energy. We've got an abundance of not just coal, uranium. Uh, we, we we should we should and not just should we be using it, but it should be fueling our economy and and industries. And uh, I've I've said this before, and it, it just seems that the the the, the coalition they they still feel that they have to be committed to climate change policy which is why they're in this position or where we're not going to be uh, extreme uh, as labor and they they put up this sort of half defense of coal saying yeah like it's part of the the, the energy mix but uh, uh tony it's clear that tony abbott and the other the other backbenchers um are in the in the minority still in the in the coalition party room i mean we're not going to see a rerun of uh Turnbull Abbott like we saw in in 2009 it's I mean Turnbull he's he lost his 38th news poll uh, in a row there is time for the the Liberal Party uh, to panic but it seems that they're happy with this oh, as I described before least uh, the the less bad option I can corroborate that, actually. I have heard um, certain staffers and former staffers saying to me and lamenting to me privately that the Liberal Party members in the House of Representatives and even the Senators are happy to just go down into perdition be because they don't see any other way, because they realise even if they did bring Abbott back, they would still lose, and they don't want to do what Labor did in 2013 trying to save the furniture. The Liberal Party has basically lost. Unless something comes out that damns Shorten, that puts him in jail. <laughs> He's Teflon Bill at the moment. I mean, they've dragged him before a Royal Commission. Uh, they've what, raided his old union. <laughs> what else can they throw at him? Well, that's the question, isn't it? I don't think... If there is anything else that they can throw at him, really. I mean, there might be something that we don't know about, but I doubt it. Look, Bill Shorten is the best asset for the Liberal Party in terms of, you know, clinging, clinging ever so desperately to power. But if the Liberal Party somehow manages to defy my expectations and my own statistical analysis 
at this time and manages to win the next general election against Labor, Albo, Albo will come in and he will destroy the coalition. And then we'll have Albo as prime minister at the next and the following general election. But the thing with Bill Shorten is that he didn't get to where he was by playing nice. Bill Shorten is a very, very clever man. And he has a lot of rat cunning in him. When you look at the story of how he got into federal parliament in the first place, you understand what kind of ambition drives him. He's not going to allow. He's not going to allow anything to go wrong if he has any control over it. And the thing is, you mentioned Tony Abbott before. If Tony Abbott would be so spiteful as to actually vote against the NEG, personally, I think he should not to be spiteful, but because you don't get, you don't make good policy through less bad policy. It doesn't work that way. It's like throwing a brick through a window and doing that instead of, you know, blowing it up with a fireball. <laughs> it doesn't work. You're still damaging the window. Well, Parliament, as it always has when it comes back, it's uh, it's back with a bang, and um, yeah, <laughs> who knows what else will happen uh, next week. We'll see if the the left can become uh, more triggered, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll see if or any of these other uh, policy pets of Malcolm Turnbull will, will come to fruition. But thanks for coming back on, Michael, and uh, discussing the, the return of Parliament with me. Thanks, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Coming up in Melbourne this month is the March for Men, which will be on Saturday the 25th of August at 1pm at Federation Square. It is designed to bring attention to men's issues and say that it is okay to be masculine. It is being organised by local social media personality Sydney Watson, the Campaign Against Racism and Fascism, uh, along with the National Union of Students Women's Department, have organised a counter-protest against what they call a far-right and racist and bigoted event. We will be there to cover the event from both sides, so stay tuned for that, and please don't be deterred from attending. The next international guest coming to Australia is former UKIP leader and Brexit champion Nigel Farage. Next month, he is visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane, as well as Auckland. The Campaign Against Racism and Fascism are planning to go along to that Melbourne event as well, but I think they'll find it a bit more difficult to disrupt an event with an international politician. You can get your tickets, including various VIP passes, by visiting nigellive.com.au. Also, to make sure that we can continue to put content out on a regular basis and cover all the news as it happens, uh, please consider becoming a patron of The Unshackled at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.